Did someone say math? Look, I know many of you took AB Psych to learn how the brain works, and maybe to help diagnose your weird cousin Chad. But don't panic, this isn't calculus. No graphing calculator, no solving for x. This is psychological statistics, the kind of math that helps us make sense of behavior, not just numbers. Today, we're diving headfirst into the world of statistics and data interpretation. So if you're ready, grab your notes, fire up those neurons, let's jump in. Psychological researchers collect a lot of data, test scores, survey responses, reaction times, brain scans, you name it. And they need a way to make sense of it all without drowning in spreadsheets. That's where statistics comes in. But hold up, before we can analyze anything, we need to collect the data first. And psychologists typically do that in one of two ways, quantitative and qualitative research. Quantitative research is all about numbers, or more specifically, numerical data. Think a survey with a Likert scale. For example, you're given the following statement, I enjoy meeting new people, and you must respond using a scale from one, strongly disagree, to five, strongly agree. That's a quantitative approach. It gives researchers numerical data they can easily measure and compare. Qualitative research, on the other hand, focuses on words, meanings, and deeper non-numerical insight. Think structured interviews, open-ended questions, or detailed observations. If I ask you, can you describe how you feel when you're meeting someone for the first time? Now we're getting into qualitative territory. Instead of rating your experience on a scale, you explain it using your own words, and that gives researchers rich descriptive data to analyze. All right, so now we've got your data. What do we do with it? First up, measures of central tendency. That's a fancy stats term for asking, what's typical here? There are three ones you need to know, mean, median, and mode. Suppose you ask 10 high school athletes how strongly they agree with this statement. I perform better under pressure. Using a Likert scale, one strongly disagree, five strongly agree. Here are the responses. Now, let's break it down. Mean is the average. It's the number that tries to represent everyone, even if that one extreme score, looking at you number two, is dragging it down. Median is the middle number when the scores are in order. Here's an AP Psych memory hack. Picture a median like the divider in the middle of a road. It splits the data in half no matter how wild the scores are on the ends. And lastly, the mode, the number or value that shows up most often. It's the most popular answer in the group, basically the homecoming queen of the data set. In this case, the mode is four because it appears more than any other number. All right, so we've nailed the middle, but now it's time for the next big question. How much variety is in the data? Are the scores all clumped together in a cozy little bunch or scattered like someone dropped a bag of Skittles? That's where measures of variability come in, or in AP terms, how consistent or scattered the responses are. Let's break down three ways psychologists measure that spread. First up, the range, and that one's easy. Just take the highest score and subtract it by the lowest score. From our previous data set, highest is five, lowest is two, five minus two, the range is three. Next up is standard deviation, and this one's super useful. Standard deviation tells us how spread out the scores are around the mean. In other words, how much variety is hiding behind the nice looking average. Let's say you're choosing between two vacation spots. Both places have an average temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Sounds perfect, right? But here's the catch. Beachtown A has daily temps that are pretty consistent, sunny, predictable, easy to pack for. Mountain Resort B, total chaos. Snow boots one day, sunscreen the next. Same mean, very different vibes. Beachtown A has a low standard deviation. Temperatures stay close to 80 degrees. Mountain Resort B has a high standard deviation. The temps are all over the place. And that's why standard deviation matters. It tells us how reliable, consistent, or unpredictable your average really is. So now that you know how spread out scores can be, what does that look like when we graph it? When data is spread out evenly or symmetrically with about 50% of the scores on each side of the mean, it forms something very familiar the normal distribution curve, also known as the bell curve, because, well, it looks like a bell. In a normal distribution, the mean, median, and mode are all the same value. It's the statistical equivalent of everyone actually agreeing on something. Most scores fall near the middle, and fewer appear on the extremes. A lot of traits in a population follow this bell-shaped curve, things like height, weight, intelligence, and so on. Most people cluster around the average, and only a few are out there in the super short or mad genius zones. Here's where it gets statistically satisfying. 68% of the scores fall within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% fall within two standard deviations, and 99.7% fall within three standard deviations. 
This is known as the 6895 99.7 rule. Your new best friend when you see a bell curve. So in a perfect world, data forms a nice symmetrical bell curve. But in real life, it's not always so balanced. Sometimes the data leans or skews in one direction. That's where we talk about skewness, when a distribution is lopsided instead of that satisfying bell shape. In a positively skewed distribution, most scores are low and the tail stretches to the right. Think of test scores where most people bombed, but a few aced it. In a negatively skewed distribution, most scores are high and the tail stretches to the left, like when almost everyone crushed the quiz except for that one person who forgot it was happening. Looking at you, Julia. All right, here's an AP Psych memory hack. Think of a whale. If the tail points left, the whale is sad. That's a negative skew, he's swimming away from home. If the tail points to the right, the whale's happy. That's a positive skew, he's swimming toward home. Yes, you just pictured a whale on a graph. Mission accomplished. Up to this point, we've been focusing on describing data, like how typical or spread out it is. But what if we want to go beyond just describing data and actually start drawing conclusions, like testing hypotheses or establishing causality? Now we're stepping into the world of experiments and inferential statistics, where we don't just summarize the data, we interpret it and make decisions and predictions. If a researcher is curious about whether the findings are real or just random, that's where the p-value comes in. p stands for probability. The p-value helps answer the question, how likely is it that these results happen by chance? A small p-value, usually less than 0.05, means it's unlikely the results happen by chance. So we consider them statistically significant. But hold up, just because a result is statistically significant doesn't mean it's life-changing. Sometimes it's more like, technically true but barely noticeable? That's why we also look at something called effect size, because not all results are created equal. A small effect size means the difference is real but super tiny, like drinking a brand new energy drink and running 0.2 seconds faster than your mile. Technically faster, but are we impressed? A large effect size, on the other hand, means the difference is big and meaningful, like switching training routines and knocking a full minute off your mile time. Now that is noticeable and meaningful. All right, let's lock in with a quick recap. We just explored the world of statistics and data interpretation and how psychologists make sense of all the numbers they collect in the research. Tattoo this on your psych brain. Measures of central tendency, mean, median, mode, tell us what's typical. Measures of variability, like range and standard deviation, tell us how spread out the scores are because averages alone don't tell the full story. A normal distribution is that nice bell-shaped curve where most scores cluster around the average. Skewed distributions happen when extreme scores crash the party and drag the mean with them. Cue the sad whale. P-values help us test for statistical significance, can we trust the results? And effect size helps us figure out if it actually matters in real life. Okay, but is it a big deal? All right, thanks for watching AB Psych Brainiacs. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss that next video. And as always, when in doubt, trust the data, not your guts. See you next time.